Good afternoon, everybody. We want to welcome you to the 2017 Medical Laboratory Sciences Research Symposium. We are very excited this afternoon to have our students presenting on the projects that they have worked, on the research that they have spent uh, quite a few hours doing, and we look forward to each other presentations. After my introduction, we will continue the program unannounced. They have their orders. They know they will uh, come up here and present. But before we begin, we ask that you please join us in a word of prayer. So we ask that we stand up here. For those that are joining us online, we will now have a prayer. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you again for another day of life. We thank you for the minds that you have created in us and that you have allowed us to be able to have inquisitive uh, spirits. And this afternoon, Lord, we share the knowledge that the students have learned and the things that they have discovered. We pray, Lord, you be with them and that as they present this afternoon. Be with those that are watching us through the live stream. We thank you for their support. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Now we'll now begin with our first group. Good afternoon, and thank you for coming to be a part of our research symposium. My name is Christovia Kalmer, and these are my colleagues. Adia Russell. Keisha Neymaifa. And today, we will be presenting to you on the topic, a search and accuracy in hemoglobin measurement in an assay for wavelength modification. Our presentation is going to include our research purpose, our hypothesis, our background, methodology, results, discussion, and conclusion. So the purpose of our research was to basically modify the sodium hydroxide method proposed to us by Professor Daniel Gonzalez as an alternative for hemoglobin determination in the clinical lab. So we wanted to compare our results to those that we, can, we obtained from the clinical lab, and the clinical lab actually uses what is called the Drabkin's method. So we wanted to explore two different parameters, and that included wavelengths outside of the standard 540 nanometers, and also to test our samples at body temperature. So our hypothesis was basically, like I said earlier, to see that sodium hydroxide is actually a fitting alternative to the Dropkins method for hemoglobin determination. And our goal was to fail to reject this hypothesis. So a little background is that hemoglobin is actually one of the most top audit tests in the laboratory today. And like I said earlier, the Dropkins method is the golden standard for hemoglobin determination. However, it contains what is called cyan methemoglobin, which actually has cyanide in it, which is, which is actually toxic and it's not travel friendly. And our whole purpose is to have this reagent to, for the mission field. So here we, we compare both reagents. And as you can see, sodium hydroxide is easier to make. It's readily available. It's affordable and travel friendly, as opposed to the Drabkin's reagent, which is manufactured. It's not easily obtained. It's costly. And like I said, it is travel restricted. So now, Adia will give you some insight on our methodology. So now I will talk about the methodology used for our research. As Christovia said, our methodology was proposed by Professor Daniel Gonzalez. And this method shows that sodium hydroxide is a viable reagent. However, we want to improve the method so it is our goal to improve the method for accuracy. We did this by changing a few parameters, and these parameters include making, incubating our samples at 37 degrees, which mimics body temperature, and adjusting the wavelengths to 490 nanometers and 600 nanometers. So 
I'm just going to go over the steps that we did. The first thing we did was prepare a 0.007 molar concentration of sodium hydroxide. And, and after preparing this reagent, we then prepared the samples using a 1 to 100 dilution. In the original method, a 1 to, 1, a 1 to 200 dilution was used. However, after testing our first batch of samples, we discovered that using a 1 to 100 dilution would be better for it. Previous, re previous research have also shown that a higher concentration of hemoglobin may be more suitable for measuring the hemoglobin measurement. Okay. And after preparing the samples, we then incubated them at room temperature to give the reagent time to lyse the cells. And after lysing, after incubating them, we then centrifuged it. And we extracted the supernatant from the, from the tube so that we can further measure the hemoglobin because the the, the supernatant is where the hemoglobin is found. Yeah. And after, incubate, after extracting it, we then incubated it again at 37 degrees this time so that we can mimic body temperature. And after incubating it at this temperature, we then measured the wavelength at its perspective wavelength which is 490 nanometers and 600 nanometers. And after measuring the wavelengths, we then calculated the hemoglobin values using the bear the bears law. So now Casey will then give us our results. So on the screen, we have our graph. In blue, we have our reference value, which is what we use as our standard. And in maroon, we have our data for our 490 nanometer wavelength. And in brown, we have our data for our 600 nanometer wavelength. As you can see closely, our data for our 490 nanometer is much closer to the standard value compared to our 600, 90, 600 nanometer wavelength. Below our graph, we have three different sets of p-values obtained after running a paired t-test. And for our overall 40-patient sample, we obtained a p-value of 0 0.005 for our 490 nanometer wavelength, and we obtained a p-value of 0 0.000 for our 600 nanometer wavelength. And referring back to the graph, on the left side of the hyphenated line, which is our first batch of samples, you can see that this part of the hyphenated line, which is on your left, it follows a different trend than our second batch of samples, which is on the right side of the hyphenated line. So we then decided to divide our data into two. And we got a p-value for our first batch of 0.00 for both our 490 nanometer and 600 nanometer wavelength. And for our batch two, we got a 0.00 p-value for our 600 nanometer wavelength, but we got a 0.769 for our 490 nanometer wavelength. So then we decided to run a linear regression for our 490 nanometer wavelength, which looks more accurate to us. And for this linear regression graph, we aim to get as close as much as possible for, to one for our slope value. And we obtained a slope value of 0.68, which is actually really pretty high considering that these outliers you see right here are probably due to the old patient samples that we used, which is uh, our first batch of patient samples. So had we used all new patient samples for our data, what we have right here could have much been closer to one that, in, that it is actually right now. So back to our p-values, what do these mean? So our total p-value and our batch one p-values, we obtained a p-value of less than 0.05, meaning that our results were significantly different from each other. However, for a p-value for 490 nanometer wavelength, we got a p-value of 0.69, which means that our values, 
our sample means were close to the hospital values, which means that our results are, indis are actually indistinguishable from the hospital values. So overall, we found our 490 nanometer results more promising than our 600 nanometer wavelength. And by adjusting a few more parts to the method, such as maybe testing more new patient samples and increasing the concentration of sodium hydroxide, it is highly possible that sodium hydroxide can, in fact, be used for clinical testing in the field. And once proven that this method is actually valid, clinical testing is needed in order for actual patient reporting. Okay, so we would like to give a special thanks to our research mentor, Professor Timothy Newkirk, our research coordinator, Professor Daniel Gonzalez, the chair of our department, Dr. Karen Reiner, and also Dr. Shondell Henson for helping us with our statistics. Any questions? Yes? How old were our samples? They were a week old. A week old. Oh. The first batch. The first batch. Yes. And the, and the second time we got we tested them the same day we got them. Oh. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, why did you guys choose to use sodium hydroxide as the reagent? So why did we choose to use sodium hydroxide? The reason for using it is because the we were, we're trying to figure out an alternative, and sodium hydroxide was already, already, it was already in a trial, which it hadn't really gotten all the way up to accuracy. So we wanted to try and change some parameters to bring it to that accuracy for the mission field. Yes. I was wondering why you use 37 degrees. Why we use 37 degrees? Okay, we use 37 degrees because the goal of our research was to adjust the uh, method, the sodium hydroxide method. And we thought that increasing the temperature to 37 degrees will mimic body temperature. So we just wanted to see how the reaction will occur as if it were, was in vivo, like in the body. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, when we first got our first batch of patient samples, we actually used a different dilution, and it was um, too late for us. And it was well, we had no more time to repeat our test that same day, so we waited another week until <coughs> we could retest the samples again, and we used a different um, dilution. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out to our symposium. My name is Yandra Gilbert, and these are my colleagues. I'm Monique Allen. And I'm Rondi Gordon. And we're going to talk to you guys today about a semi-quantitative measurement of bovine mastitis-causing organisms that are found in composted manure bedding here at the Andrews University Dairy. Our research mentor was Professor Timothy Newkirk, and we teamed up with Dr. Catherine Kudel, who is the chair of the Agriculture Department. And we're under the supervision of our research coordinator, Professor Daniel Gonzalez, and the chair of our department, Dr. Karen Reiner. So today we'll be talking to you guys about what our question was for research. We're also going to talk to you guys about how we decided to go about answering this question and what we found and why it's significant and why it may not be significant. 
So when people think of dairy farmers, they typically think of people who milk the cows and that's the extent of their knowledge about dairy farmers. However, dairy farmers also have a more important job, which is ensuring that there's no bacteria in the milk that we give out for consumption. One of the diseases that um, dairy farmers look out for because of the bacterial pathogens that could infect the milk is bovine mastitis. Um, mastitis is defined as the inflammation of the mammary gland, and in cows, that's called the udder. Bovine mastitis is important because it's the most commonly occurring disease in the bovine species. And there's an, the dairy industry estimates a revenue loss of $1.7 to $2 billion per year because of bovine mastitis. So what causes mastitis? Mastitis is caused by bacterial pathogens. These pathogens are typically split into two categories, two main categories, I should say. The, there are environmental pathogens and there's contagious pathogens. Contagious, are, contagious pathogens are those that are exposed to the cows during the milking process. And environmental pathogens are those that are found in the living quarters of the cow. So that could be the bedding, the manure, the mud, and things like that. Um, since over the past couple of years, there's been a lot of research and a lot of regulation on how to keep the bacterial load of contagious pathogens down. So we've, we're focusing on environmental pathogens because those are the ones that are found everywhere in you know, typical soil and stuff like that. Um, the primary pathogens that we were looking for for this research was Klebsiella, E. coli, Strep non agalactiae, and Staph aureus. And the question that we're answering is, are there any mastitis causing organisms in, present in the bedding at the Andrews University Dairy? So another research we, question we had was, does the Andrews University Dairy's composting process contribute to an overall decrease in the amount of bacteria? Composting is an aerobic process in which microbes break down organic materials and aid in the removal of pathogenic bacteria. During our evaluation, we expected to see an overall decrease. We collected 11 samples at certain checkpoints throughout the composting process. This began with the manure being flushed from the cow stalls and drained into what's called an agitator, which is pictured here. The agitator fills with water and homogenizes the liquid. Afterwards, it is mixed with sawdust and taken to another machine which spins the mixture and removes excess moisture. The actual composting process then begins and two by 20 foot piles of this mixture is laid with a long pipe down the middle that aerates the mixture. This is aerated for three weeks at a time. And when the drying process is complete, it is then placed in the uh, stalls two times per week. We took samples at these checkpoints and including samples from the machine that places the bedding in the cow stalls, the sawdust that they mix the manure with, and the bedding that has been in the stalls for one day. Okay, so in order to determine if the bedding contained mastitis causing bacteria, we carried out three main steps. We collected the samples, we cultured them, and then we carried out a few biochemical tests to determine the idea of the microbacteria. So, we, as Monique said, we collected one sample per section, giving us 11 sections in, samples in total, and we collected them every Thursday, and we did this because the dairy farmers changed the bedding out every Tuesday and Friday, and this allowed us to get samples that had been under the cow for at least one day, and samples right before it goes under the cows. We collected this every Thursday for three weeks, giving us three samples in total. So when we cultured them, we suspended them in sterile saline and then plated them on a McConkie plate to isolate gram-negative bacteria, a CNA plate to isolate gram-positive bacteria, and a streptococcus selective plate for those that we suspected were streptococcus. They were then incubated overnight, and then we carried out a bunch of different biochemical tests to ID the bugs. So on the first week, we tested the sample from the bedding right before it goes under the cow, and we found growth on a CNA plate. We gram stained them, and we found that they were gram-positive cocci. So we then did a catalase test, and they turned out to be catalase negative. We then did a strep quick kit, 
and we found out that it was bile esculin positive and showed no growth in a salt broth. This brought us to the conclusion that it was a gamella species, which is a part of the Streptococcus non-Agalactiae family. We then found growth on a MAC, however, it was oxidase positive, leading us to believe that it was not Klebsiella or E. coli. On the second week, we didn't find any significant bacteria. However, on the third week, from the sample that, was, that were in the stalls under the cows for one day, we found growth on the CNA plate. We gram stained it to be gram positive cocci, and we did a co coagulase and a catalase test. They were both negative, and we found no growth on a streptococcus plate. This indicated that it was neither Staphylococcus aureus or Streptococcus non agalactiae. We found growth on a MAC, and it was oxidase negative, leading us to do an API strip, which gave us the conclusion that it was Escherichia coli. So this graph represents the amount of bacteria found throughout the composting process. It was graded, and these pictures that you can see, the 2 plus growth meant that it grew into the second quadrant, and then the 4 plus growth meant that it grew into the fourth quadrant of the plate. It was taken from the fresh liquid the, after the moisture had been removed from the bedding and then uh, in weeks where it was being dried and then the final product directly before it was placed into the uh, cow stalls. As you can see, we did not find a overall decrease in bacteria load over the composting process. So in conclusion, we identified two species a bacterium which are known contributors to bovine mastitis. Uh, this includes gamella, which is within the streptococcus family. And then we also identified E. coli, which was found in the bedding from the stalls. But because uh, it was found at this point, we can't deduce whether or not it was from the uh, normal gut flora, from the cows shedding it in their feces, or if it was actually from the composting process. The evaluation of the amount of bacteria during the composting process showed no trend or decrease in the amount of bacteria present. Furthermore, research could be conducted to determine if the bovine mastitis contributing agents are present throughout the entire composting process, as well as more research that could be done to determine what other environmental factors may play a role in the contribution to bovine mastitis. So at this time, we'd like to give a special thank you to those of you who helped us with our research. That would be Professor Melissa Poa, our research mentor, Professor Timothy Newkirk, um, Dr. Catherine Kudel, who is the head of the Agriculture Department, our research um, coordinator, which is Professor Daniel Gonzalez, the chair of our department, Dr. Karen Reiner. And we'd also like to give a special thank you to Andrews University Dairy Farm, including Mr. Jim and Mr. Larry. Are there any questions? <laughs> so why did you guys only ID the organisms in the last couple of steps? She asked why we only ID'd the organisms that were in the last steps. This is because they were coming into direct contact with the cows in the stalls. I have a question from somebody in Western Australia who asked why did you choose to search for only certain bacteria? How did you choose them, such as E. coli and Klebsiella? Okay, so we they asked why did we choose to only look for those four yeah, organisms? Those specific organisms. Those specific four organisms, mm -hmm. and those organisms were Klebsiella, E. coli, Staph aureus, and Strep non agalactiae. We chose that those four because previous research shows that those were the um, organisms that were known to cause bovine mastitis most frequently. I have another question that was posted in our online feed. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were asking if you can reiterate why um, you chose to collect the samples on a specific day, I think the actual Thursday. Oh, we chose it on Thursday. Oh, the question was, why did we choose to collect the samples on Thursday, such a specific day? And we chose that because the dairy farmers change out the bedding every Tuesday and Friday. And this allows us to get samples right before it goes into the stalls for the cows and right one day after the cows have been on them. Are there any more questions? 
<laughs> I think there's someone that's trying to write something like the way it would have been. So, something uh, uh, Yes. <laughs> can, you, can you clarify what's happening with this composting and why are the cows sitting on it? Can you, ex can you explain what, what's the um, process here? So they're recycling the manure and mixing it with sawdust to make the bedding in the stalls. So the composting process is supposed to decrease the bacterial load and then they get it in the stalls. Anything else? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just closer. Oh, um, okay. There you go. How do you come to the top? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Abdul Fattah, and this is my um, teammate, Annie, and Addis, and today we're going to talk about the survival of probiotics bacteria after exposure to an in vitro digestive environment. And um, I'm going to talk about the purpose and hypothesis, and uh, Annie is going to talk about materials and methods and results. Um, Adis is going to talk about the conclusion and discussion. So what are probiotics? Probiotics are good bacteria that are um, similar to the bacteria that we have in lower digestive tract. And our lower digestive tract have um, a greater amount of bacteria than uh, the red cells that we have. So that's why our uh, lower digestive tract is a good environment for these bacteria to grow. And there are um, some benefits of probiotics include reduction of cholesterol, cancer prevention, um, enhancement of immunity, and improvement of intestinal health. And um, there are many kinds of probiotics in the market. And we wanted to compare different source, sources and see um, how would the probiotics uh, survive. And we expose probiotics bacteria to different stomach pHs and record their survival. And also, we wanted to determine how enzymes affect the survival of bacterium in the stomach. Good afternoon. I'm going to be presenting the materials and methods from our experiment. We decided to have three different sources of bacteria. That one, uh, they are Nucific BioX, Probiotics, and True Nature, and Activia. Um, Nucific BioX are probiotics that contain uh, bifidobacterium and lactobacillus, as well as enzymes such as lipase and amylase. Lipase and amylase are used to uh, break down lipids and starch. True Nature only has um, lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, and Activia contains lactobacillus and um, bifidobacterium, as well as Streptococcus thermophilus. Streptococcus thermophilus uh, helps to break down lactose, and this is good for people that are lactose intolerant. 
From now on, on our experiment, um, on our presentation, when we refer to nocific BioX, we're going to refer to it as pills with enzymes, and the true nature are going to be the pills with, without enzyme. We also use hydrochloric acid to simulate the pH of our stomach, as well as beakers, uh, magnetic stair bars, and two different agar plates. In our method, we use for control, we dissolve the pills in the eye water, and then we um, dissolve hydrochloric acid with the eye water to obtain the two different pHs. We mix them together and test them with a pH strip to achieve the desired pH. We um, mix them until we reach 700 ml of product. And then we digested the pills um, with enzymes, without enzymes, and the yogurt for 25 to 30 minutes, continuously mixing them with a stir bar. Um, in our method, methodology, we um, incubated them in two different plates, lactobacillus agar and anaerobic CDC plate. And we did that for 48 hours in an anaerobic and capnophilic conditions. In our results, in this graph, we divided it into groups. The first group is the lactobacillus agar, and the second group is the anaerobic blood plate. The first row, which is the blue one right here, is um, representing the pills with the enzymes. As we can see, there was no growth for both plates at any pH or control. The second row, the red uh, columns, represent the pills without the enzymes. Uh, we can see that there is growth for the control and the pH of 4 for both agars. And the last row, the third one, the green row, is representing the yogurt. And we can also see growth um, for the control and the pH of 4 for both agars. Good evening. I'm going to present our result and conclusion. When we, after we did our experiment, we observed the absence of bacterial growth in the presence of enzyme. And again, the absence of bacterial growth at the pH of 2. But we observed the growth of bacterial at the pH of 4 with, without enzyme and with yogurt. And this led us to wonder if the presence of enzyme is inhibiting the growth of bacterial and the pH of 2 is not supportive. The acidity of the pH of 2 in the stomach is not supporting the growth of bacterial again. So we are wondering if the, absence, the presence of enzyme is inhibiting the growth of bacterial and the pre, at the pH of 2 also it is, there is no growth even with the yogurt, with the pill, with enzyme and without enzyme. So this may be the field for future study to what is the cause of the, what is the cause for of enzyme again is the bacterial growth if it is inhibiting or if it has some other relation so uh, at the pH of four when we observed the growth of bacterial it was a good amount of bacterial which can lead us to conclude our experiment the use of probiotics as a pill with enzyme or yogurt or different kinds of probiotics which can lead us to conclude that maybe taking the probiotics with full with meal with full stomach which simulate the pH of four can be ben more beneficial than taking with two pH which simulates the empty stomach. And and Probiotics is definitely a future study. It has health benefit. It can boost the immune system, even though it needs more research and more data. So we would like to thank you, our research mentor, Professor Melissa Poa, and our research coordinator, Professor Daniel Gonzalez, and the Department of Medical Laboratory Science as a whole for giving us an opportunity to study and learn and explore. 
and these are our reference we used when we were doing our research and experiment we were searching for the page and for all the information what we get is from this reference now it is time to question if any person we are open for the question yes yes uh, i want to ask a question about your methodology what um, did you just use 700 Yeah. Oh. Okay, why we, her question is, why we used 700 ml of, uh, the, with pH of 2 and 4, is that uh, 700 ml is the fluid amount after male in our stomach, which is where we got our research. When we were researching, we got the information. So that is why we were simulating the stomach acidity and the fluid. That's why we used it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Can your controls show no growth for the DM water? For the pH of 2. For the pitch of two, yes. Okay. For both products? Bo um, in both plates, for the pills with enzymes, pills with no enzymes, and the yogurt. And that was just the pH of two with just the water? Yes. Mm -hmm. We also didn't see any growth for the pills with enzymes. They didn't grow any. Yeah. yeah. Do those have any Um, he's asking, he's asking if the pills, the, the bottle has instructions to take it with meals or not. Um, I don't remember seeing that. Yes, no, I, I don't, I don't remember seeing that. Yeah, but. To add, maybe to add on that one way, while I was searching, when we were searching on the research, we, I found that uh, taking probiotics without uh, meal is more beneficial, it contradicts, but that's why probiotics are a field of future study you know, to, to explore a lot, because some information. Good evening. Thank you all for coming and listening to all our oh, and listening to all our research presentations. My name is D'Angela Samonte, and these are my colleagues Jordan Parker and Hannah Nabarte. Um, the title of our research is Plasma Magnesium Levels as an Indicator of Clinical Inflammation. I would like to break down our title and give you some definitions on what we're going to be talking in our presentation today. Clinical inflammation is the immune response to self-antigen, meaning that the immune system attacks normal healthy tissue thinking that's a harmful pathogen. So um, this causes the aches and the pains and the swelling that we see in diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, cardiovascular disease, and trauma, and even something as small as getting a splinter on your finger. Magnesium is an essential mineral and intracellular cation and a cofactor for enzymes in the pathophysiology in our body systems. Um, if you refer to your brochures, under the heading introduction, it mentions that magnesium and other divalent cations contribute to the development of certain chronic diseases, such as hypertension and diabetes. C-reactive proteins are the most sensitive of the acute phase reactants, and its a concentration increases rapidly as um, during inflammatory 
processes. So it's an excellent indicator for inflammation in the body. Initially, we were planning to work with eclamptic patients. However, due to the time constraints and seeing that there was no pre-eclamptic uh, patients that we saw from the data that we got from the Memorial Hospital of South Bend, we decided that we had to focus on a population that was more readily available. Uh, we discovered as we looked at our patients that we could differentiate our sample into two categories, acute and chronic. Acute meaning that there was a rapid onset of symptoms and chronic meaning that it was more subtle. It had more time to develop and our patients would experience it for a longer time. Um, after looking at this data, we developed a hypothesis that there would be an inversely proportional ratio between CRP and magnesium levels. If there are high levels of CRP, there would be low levels of magnesium. And my colleague, Jordan Parker, is going to keep going and tell us how we tested this hypothesis. Thank you, Angela. As she just uh, stated, um, we were looking for correlation in magnesium and CRP in uh, either acute or chronic conditions. Uh, therefore, we had to uh, develop a correlational analysis that pertained to these two variables, CRP and magnesium. Uh, we also had, therefore, we had to acquire uh, quantifiable data in which we can perform statistical evaluation to provide validity toward our hypothesis. Uh, our sample testing, yeah. oh. our sample testing began at Memorial Hospital of South Bend, where they were able to provide uh, records of serum analysis starting from January to November 2017. Criteria for our samples required um, obviously CRP levels and magnesium, but both levels had to be measured. Uh, within 24 hours. Um, in addition to those, uh, South Bend provided uh, the sex of the patient and um, the original complaint. We would also like to mention that uh, no patient identifiers were provided in the data. Uh, therefore, our data cannot be traced back to the original patient. Uh, South Bend uses the COBOS 6000 for this type of specimen analysis. Um, just to mention, uh, mention a few things. Uh, it is an efficient analyzer. Uh, it can produce, uh, process over 200 different types of analysis at a rate of 600 tests per hour. It's a modular system um, consisting of a uh, immunochem module and a chemistry module. Uh, our samples required uh, the use of both modules. Uh, high sensitivity CRP was measured in the immunochem module, uh, which would be the one on the far right there. Uh, it used a particular enhancement immuno, immunoturbinometric assay. <laughs> this, uh, this test uses latex particles coated in uh, antibodies towards uh, the CRP. Uh, the CRP in this case would be acting as the antigen. So the test chamber consists of excess uh, particulate reagent and with the addition of uh, a measured volume of uh, the serum. So the serum and the uh, uh, reagent are allowed to react. And then after a wash, the concentration is determined by the transmittance of light through a sample. The less transmittance means higher turbidity and higher concentration of the solution. Therefore, the inverse. Uh, therefore, this is an infer, inverse relationship between transmittance and concentration. And uh, CRP was measured in milligrams per liter. Oh, too soon. Uh, magnesium was measured in the chemistry module. Uh, it uses uh, utilizes a Colometric endpoint method to measure serum magnesium levels. In this method, magnesium forms a complex with 
xylidin blue reagent, the concentration is photometrically uh, oh, I'm sorry, the concentration is measured photometrically via the decrease in absorbance of xylidin blue. So again, it is another inverse relationship. So as we see a decrease in uh, absorbance, we will see an increase in uh, magnesium concentration. And magnesium was measured in milligrams per deciliter. After we established or after we made our request and established our criteria for our sampling, uh, South Bend provided 309 uh, data, uh, data points. 87 of them proved to be valid toward our research. Again, to reiterate, uh, our samples needed CR, uh, CRP and magnesium. If either one of those, uh, those were not provided, uh, that assay would be, or I'm sorry, that those data points would be eliminated, along with any data points did not, uh, any data points that didn't provide um, CRP levels and magnesium levels that were measured within 24 hours. Uh, after separation of our um, data points, our 87 valid points were separated into chronic and acute conditions. Chronic conditions were defined as CRP levels less than um, five milligrams per liter, and acute conditions were defined as CRP levels greater than five milligrams per liter. So after we were able to separate into chronic and acute conditions, we uh, graphically plotted our our data on a scatter plot to visualize to provide a visual reference of the correlation. And in addition, we also produced a Pearson's R value to demonstrate the strength of our correlation. And at this point, I'll have Hannah articulate the results. Okay. Um, so continuing after um, where Jordan left off, I will be addressing the statistics we used to observe. <laughs> um, I will be addressing the statistics we used to observe the data in determining whether or not <laughs> in determining whether or not our um, hypothesis was true. Um, the first thing we did was graph our points on a scatter plot, um, and this is a visual. Imp um, this will provide a visual aid to see if there was any linear reg regression. Then we use the P Pearson's R correlation coefficient to determine the extent to which our two variables magnesium and CRP are related. The closer the R value is to one, the stronger the correlation. And the closer the um, R value is to zero means no correlation at all. And lastly, we use the p-test to determine whether or not our results were significant. If they were less than the 0 0.05, we could accept our alternative hypothesis. If it was above, we would accept our um, we'd have to accept our null hypothesis. Okay. The first graph I am showing you is the magnesium levels in patients with acute conditions. These conditions include some things like trauma, respiratory arrest, or sepsis. Um, and looking at the graph, it appears that there is a weak correlation, and as represented in our Pearson's correlation coefficient, it is 0 0.13. But because we weren't sure if um, our, what's it called? If our outlier was causing this regression, we redid the statistics and found out that our Pearson's correlation coefficient was actually much lower. And this value is suggestive that there is no correlation at all. And same thing with our p-value. Our p-value is high, so we can say that this is not significant and our data, there is no correlation. Um, next is our magnesium levels in patients with chronic conditions. And some of the chronic conditions that our patients exhibited was hypokalemia and aphasia. Um, here you can see that there is a negative linear regression, and our Pearson's correlation coefficient is negative 0.82, and that is pretty close to ne um, a value of 1. So we can say here that our value is clinically significant, or a strong clinical correlation. And our p-value was really low, which means that it is significant. 
So in conclusion, we can say that there is an association between magnesium and CRP in acute condition. However, uh, and we can say that, um, okay, let me repeat that again. In conclusion, we can say that there is no association between magnesium and CRP in acute condition, which makes sense because in acute conditions such as trauma, CRP will um, spike due to inflammation. And that's, why, well, that's what, what makes CRP such a great um, monitor for inflammation. And for chronic inflammation, like D'Angelo had said before, it's sub subtle and it takes time. So normally, normal healthy individuals should not have CRP in circulation. Um, and I believe that's why we could see a trend with our chronic disease. And I want you to, I want to ask you to open your pamphlets and look at the graph. And I will go back to the graph. Um, I want you to notice our um, normal range and our values that we got in um, chronic conditions. Um, all of our, the majority of our data points, they all fall within normal levels of CRP. And we find that, the, that this is significant, perhaps that this is suggestive that maybe the normal levels of magnesium needs to be reevaluated, perhaps a lot more narrower than we thought it would be. Um, we also believe that this could possibly be an indication of like um, chronic disease as it progresses. Maybe, as you could see, and magnesium levels are much more higher as your c reactive proteins are lower and decrease. Perhaps um, magnesium could be a way we can monitor chronic disease and perhaps catch it before it, um, it, gets, it progresses. And another thing that we noticed, our samples were randomized, but in chronic inflammation, um, out of the 30 points that we got, 22 of them were female. Perhaps this is suggesting that women are more prone to chronic disease, or maybe that we could use magnesium as an indicator for that. And from trying to answer our question whether or not there is a correlation between CRP and magnesium, we ended up coming up with many more questions that could be studied in further research. So before we go to questions, um, we wanted to thank uh, Memorial South Bend for giving us the data, specifically no Khan, who is the clinical specialist over there. And last but definitely not least, we would like to thank our research mentor and our research coordinator, Professor Diana Gonzalez, for helping us sort out the data, as well as guiding us throughout this whole entire experience. So now I will open the floor for questions. Do you guys have any questions? Uh, explain us again how you how did you decide to divide your product in your acute uh, patients? That's, oh. uh, that's something difficult. Something, at least difficult to sort out. Oh, okay. Um, uh, well, when we were provided our data, we were able to we were provided CRP levels, and based on our CRP levels, uh, we divided chronic conditions based on our CRP, which is defined by levels of five, uh, five milligrams per liter and below, whereas acute is defined by CRP levels above five milligrams per liter. And how we came to that conclusion yeah. is that because like for normal healthy individuals, oh. you should not have any CRP levels at all in, in circulation. So like for chronic conditions, um, CRP inflammation, you would expect it to accumulate over time. That's why we had the normal CRP um, values within, uh, we labeled that as chronic conditions. And then anything above five was the acute conditions. Any other questions?
Good evening, everybody. My name is Iris Pagarigan. And my name is Sandy Tinoco. And today we will be presenting the standardization of clinical laboratory assays panel for metabolic syndrome. Just an overview of our presentation today. First, we'll be introducing our subject, which includes the need for this research and how we, come, we came about it, what laboratory panels are, and what is metabolic syndrome. The second is we're going to go over our methodology, how we got into the study. Then we will be talking about our results and our discussion and some of the limitations that we found in our study. This picture right here is taken in Honolulu, Hawaii. And this is a picture of Queen's Medical Center. And this is how we came about with our research. Queen's Medical Center reached out to MLS professionals due to the fact that they were having a problem because their budget was being depleted because laboratory tests, I'm sorry, laboratory tests that were not being reimbursed by insurance companies due to the fact that they were not meeting medical necessities. A medical necessity defined by Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Service is are medical conditions for which a lab test service is reasonable and necessary. That means that the medical condition of the person would either increase or decrease that laboratory test. Um, one of the ways we found to solve this issue that Queens is having is the introduction of laboratory panels. Hepatic panels and renal panels are in use today and they are available for them to be used, but one of the problems that um, um, their population is having is the disorder metabolic syndrome. And there is no laboratory panel that has been um, developed for the analysis of metabolic syndrome panel. Our research, our goal was to have an operational study to establish a laboratory panel for metabolic syndrome that would satisfy the medical necessity guidelines. Okay, so what is a laboratory panel? It's a group of tests that are ordered to determine a person's general health status. Its pa panels increase sensitivity, specificity, and overall they help reduce cost. So the Medical Foundation in South Bend utilizes panels in their laboratory facility. Some of the panels that they use is the hepatic function panel, the renal panel, and the OB panel. And here's an example of the hepatic functional pa panel. These are the analytes that, are, that make up the hepatic function panel. And it includes your albumin, your bilirubin, which has your direct and indirect, your ALP, your total protein, your ALT, and your AST. Now that we have gone over what a metabolic laboratory panel is, we're going to go over what metabolic syndrome is. Metabolic syndrome is classified as a syndrome because there has been no single cause found to be causing metabolic syndrome. Some of the risk factors that have been associated with the syndrome is type 2 diabetes mellitus, atherogenic dyslipidemia, elevated blood pressure, and elevated blood glucose. All of these risk factors together have been proven to promote the development of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. It is also associated with prothrombotic and pro-inflammatory state. Our methodology in our research, first we looked at various research articles to determine what really is a metabolic syndrome and what are laboratory panels. We looked at government regulations because we wanted to fit the need of medical necessity and we looked at established diagnostic criteria. What you see on the screen right now is one of the diagnostic criteria we looked at. This is an ATP number three laboratory diagnostic criteria for metabolic syndrome. ATP stands for adult panel, adult treatment panel, sorry. And the ones that are related to the lab are elevated triglycerides, reduced HDLC, which is high density lipoprotein cholesterol, and elevated fasting glucose. So for our results, these are the tests that we chose for our metabolic syndrome panel. Hemoglobin A1C, random glucose, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, electrolytes and pH, and within my electrolytes, I chose sodium, potassium, bicarbonate, chloride, magnesium, and ion gap, and lipid profile, which includes total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, and triglycerides. So the first two tests that I'm gonna be talking about is my hemoglobin A1C and random glucose. 
The A1C is used to reflect the average blood glucose levels over the previous two to three months. It's a good test to help monitor long-term diabetes. We added the A1C because it's reliable and more convenient. And according to the American Diabetes Association, they have accepted A1C as a criteria for diabetes mellitus. Because of the ADA requires at least two of the criteria to justify diabetes mellitus, we added the random glucose. And for my A1C, an EDTA whole blood sample is needed. Now for a random glucose, hyperglycemic symptoms and a random glucose greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter is confirmation of diabetes mellitus. Another test that we included in our panel is the C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein is widely known as a marker for inflammation. We opted to choose high sensitivity C-reactive proteins because that means that it could evaluate level at low levels. Elevated HSCRP is one of the easiest measurements to detect a pro-inflammatory state. High sensitivity C-reactive protein levels greater than three milligrams per liter has also been found to be associated with metabolic syndrome and had the worst cardiac vascular survival, sorry. And um, this just proves that the metabolic syndrome is related to cardiovascular disease. Now for my electrolytes. They are a panel made up of sodium, potassium, bicarbonate, chloride, magnesium, and the anion gap. They're used to investigate conditions that cause an imbalance, such as dehydration, kidney disease, lung disease, heart conditions, and a serum or plasma sample can be used. Now I'm gonna be going over each individual ones and giving an example. So for my sodium, it's used for the regulation of water balance. Hyponatremia is usually associated with renal failure. Potassium plays an integral part in the transmission of nerve impulses. Hyperkalemia can contribute to diabetes mellitus. Chloride, its function is to maintain osmolality, blood volume, and electric balance. In hypercaloremia, since there is a loss of bicarb, this results in metabolic acidosis. My bic bicarbonate is a major form of CO2 and it acts in the bicarbonate carbonic acid buffer system to buffer any sudden changes in blood pH. In increased levels of bicarb, we see metabolic alkalosis because my bicarb is being retained. Magnesium plays an important role in the metabolism of carbohydrates, fats, nucleic acids, and proteins. Research has found that low levels of magnesium is found in type 2 diabetes mellitus. And finally, my anion gap. It's a difference between unmeasured anions and unmeasured cations. And renal failure tends to have an elevated anion gap. And pH. Acidosis decreases cardiac contract contraction and cardiac output. Hyperglycemic patients will have a decreased pH in both their blood and urine. The very last analyte that we chose to include in our metabolic syndrome panel is the non-fasting lipid profile. The lipid profile consists of testing for total cholesterol, LDL, which is low-density lipoprotein, HDL, which is high-density lipoprotein, and triglycerides. Atherogenic dyslipidemia is one of the most commonly recognized risk factors for metabolic syndrome. What that is, is high low density lipoprotein, low HDLs, and elevated triglycerides. In one of the diagnostic criteria we showed you previously, they stated that elevated triglycerides is associated with metabolic syndrome. In our study, we found that there is one limitation. This panel includes analysis of markers that require moderate complexity, and because that is so, it may not be applic applicable for all laboratory facilities. It is our hope in the future that our research could help our laboratory colleagues in Honolulu, Hawaii, that they could practice this so that they could reduce their costs in their laboratory facility. These are our references. We would like to thank our research coordinator and research mentor, Daniel Gonzalez, and the Department of Medical Laboratory Science. Are there any questions?
comprehensive metabolic panel will not get covered by insurance. Yes? Um, so I was wondering, did you get any indication of how difficult it might be to take your panel to the next step and have it qualified to pass by the public health system? Um, you mean like to take it to Hawaii? To take it to the point where Medicare and Medicaid would say, yes, you're yes. allowed to use this panel. Um, what the only issue is with Medicare and Medicaid are the ones who reimburse them. So with enough study, if other laboratory facilities would choose to include, this is just a standard, so they could still include more depending on their needs, of course. And so um, it's up to the laboratory facility if they'll be willing to use it. And for ours, we were hoping that it will meet the medical necessities of the patient because that's what they were having an issue with. Because the um, analytes were not meeting the medical necessity, they were required to pay for the laboratory test instead of the patient. And that's why um, we chose to narrow it down to just analytes that are directly related to metabolic syndrome. So. Just to follow up though, yeah. would, would those included in your proposed panel be meeting medical? Criteria? Yes. Well, we used the diagnostic criteria that we showed, the adult treatment panel, number three, that was already being in place. So that technically would meet? Yes, okay. because we, we, uh, we, okay. yeah, we addressed their elevated triglycerides. The laboratory-wise, we, we, we addressed the elevated triglycerides, um, fasting glucose, although we did replace it with HbA1c and the HDLC. I want to thank you guys for all coming out and sticking with us this far. We're the last group that's presenting, and we will be presenting on the antimicrobial properties of hybrid synthetic drugs. Okay. My name is Cassandra Drew. Uh, my name is Ola Nawachuku. My name is Sarah Smith. Today we're going to talk to you about the importance of antimicrobial susceptibility. We're also going to talk about the synthetic compounds that we used and the bacteria that we tested these compounds against. My colleague Alana will be talking about the methodology we, that we used for this testing and Sarah will be talking about the results and conclusions that we gained from our study. Antimicrobials are one of the most commonly prescribed drugs in use today. However, the CDC says that up to 50% of the time, these prescriptions are done so suboptimally. Now, what that means is that they're being prescribed when it's not needed, for the wrong amount of time, or at the wrong dosage. And this all contributes to antibiotic resistance because you're exposing bacteria to these drugs and giving them to a time to acquire resistance. Big pharmaceutical companies know that this is a big issue in medicine. However, they're less likely to invest in research on this, um, on synthesizing new antimicrobials because they're not going to get the types of return that they need to keep going. That's why it's really important, and we have such a great opportunity here at the university level to synthesize new compounds that can be used as antimicrobials and then test them to see if they work. We, the chemistry department here at Andrews University um, has led out in this by already synthesizing many compounds that could be used as antimicrobials. Our group decided to test these um, compounds that chemistry donated against many well-known bacterial strains and we decided 
to represent um, environmental flora by using Pseudomonas aeruginosa and then many um, body flora such as E. coli and Staph aureus. We also decided to test it against um, a drug resistant strain of Staph aureus called MRSA, which is methicillin resistant Staph aureus. The compounds that were donated to us were the Aridine thiohydantoin group and the Aridine pseudothiohydantoins. We had three compounds from each of these families, and you can see that they're very structurally similar with the boronic acid just on different carbons throughout the aromatic group. We numbered each of these compounds um, differently throughout our study. So we called um, them compound 1 for 2-thiohydantoin, 2-formalphenic boronic acid, and so forth, based on where the boronic acid was on the aromatic group. As you can see, this is a very slight change in the structure. However, there's quite um, big differences between the colors of each of the compounds. When we were dissolving these compounds in DMSO, which is dimethyl sulfoxide, we realized that they also dissolved slightly differently too. Okay. Um, the methodology that we implemented to test, to test the, the compounds we've gotten against the bacteria is the Kirby-Bauer method. Okay. The Kirby-Bauer method, it is a widely used diffusion assay used for antimicrobial susceptibility testing. The principle behind the Kirby-Bauer method is this. So you would make a 0 0.5 McFarland standard, and then you, from using a colony of your bacteria in saline. And then after this, you would launch, shake your Mueller hinting agar, and then after this, you would, you, you would place, um, excuse me, this that have already been infused with antimicrobials on the plate, you would incubate for 24 hours and after allowing the, the, this to diffuse through the agar. And then after the 24 hours are up, you would then read your zone of inhibition or your zone of clearance if there is any. For our study, we had two concentrations. We had a high concentration of um, a thousand micrograms and a low concentration of a hundred micrograms. Okay, to prepare our discs, we dissolved the compounds that we had gotten in dimethyl sulfoxide, also known as DMSO. And then after this, we impregnated the disc with the dissolved compounds. We then allowed the disc in, um, sufficient time to dry. After the disc have dried, we then made our own. 0.5 McFarland standard with the bacteria that we have. And then after this, we um, applied the dried disc on the long streak Mueller hinting agar. For each bacteria that we had, there was two plates for each of them. On each plate, there is a low concentration, including a control of just DMSO. The reason why we use DMSO as our control is to make sure that the the solvent in itself didn't have any antimicrobial um, properties. Okay, so to read our results after the 24 hours of incubation, I, we, this is how we read it. On disk A right, I mean, right there, you would see that the bacteria or the organisms were able to grow up to the disk. There was no inhibition at all. And on disk C, you can see that there is a zone of clearance, also known as the zone of inhibition, around the disk. This shows that the compound on the disk has some kind of inhibitory properties that is preventing the bacteria from being able to grow up to the plate. And to, measure, to, um, to read the results, you would just measure the diameter of the clearance around the disk. And after you've measured them, whatever number you, you have gotten, then you can try to determine from there if it is significant enough to say that the, the antimicrobial on the disc is, um, is significant clinically. So for our results, uh, as Ulana mentioned, we tested our compounds at a low concentration and also at a high concentration. For our low concentrations of the compounds, the bacteria were resistant to the effects of the compounds. Um, we see that they 
the bacteria were able to grow right up to the edges of the discs, so we didn't have any measurable zones of clearance or inhibition around the discs. However, at a high concentration, we did see some ability of compound 2 to inhibit growth of Staph aureus and MRSA. Um, with Staph aureus, we had 7 millimeters of a zone, and for MRSA, there was 9 millimeters of zone where the bacteria were not able to grow uh, right up to the edge of the disc in the presence of that compound. For our other bacteria, they did remain resistant to the compounds. Our gram-negative bacteria, Pseudomonas and E. coli, do tend to be a little bit tougher because they've got a nice tough cell wall that can make microbials work a little harder to kill them off. And also Enterococcus, it, even though it's gram-positive, it's a gut flora that's exposed all the time to the antibiotics that we take, and so it's developed a lot of resistance to many things that we use to try to halt its growth. So here you can see our plates where our bacteria were resistant to the compounds. You can see that the bacteria were able to grow right up to the edges of our discs, so they're able to grow in the presence of the compounds. We do see also, though, that we had good um, diffusion of the compounds into the auger. Our compounds were nice and colorful, so we can see the color diffusing away from the discs shows that there was a good concentration gradient of the compounds, which is important in Kirby-Bauer testing, so we were glad to see that. <coughs> and so, in summary, our most promising compound for an antimicrobial was compound 2, which was able to inhibit the growth of Staph aureus and MRSA to some extent. We certainly saw that that ability was correlated to the concentration of the compounds. At a low concentration, the bacteria were still able to grow, but when we increased the concentration, we did inhibit some of the growth of the microbes. And we were also interested to see that the uh, zones of inhibition were similar for Staph aureus and MRSA. MRSA is much more resistant to many commonly used antimicrobials than regular Staph aureus, but in this case, there was no significant enhancement of its ability to resist the compound. So that was interesting to note for us. So further research should include testing these compounds at higher concentrations. We saw in our literature review that um, similar compounds were effective against a variety of gram-positive and gram-negative organisms when they were tested about 150 milligrams per disc, which is about 150 times our high concentration that we were able to use in this study. So it's possible that these similar compounds might be much more effective if they were used at a much higher concentration. And also the number of microorganisms tested could be expanded to see if there's other microorganisms that might be susceptible to these compounds. And also it's good to note that this isn't the end of the line for these uh, synthetic compounds either. Uh, the chemistry department is facilitating other research that will look at the biological activity of these compounds, and they're new, and we're excited that we're able to add a piece to that knowledge by testing the antimicrobial properties of the compounds. Um, okay, we would like to um, especially thank our mentor, Professor Tasha Simpson. Thank you so much for sticking with us through this whole time. I know we struggled, but thank you so much <laughs> for helping us out. To Dr. Desmond Murray, Thank you so much for providing us with the compounds and keep up the good work in the chemistry department. To Professor Melissa Poa, thank you so much for, the, for your help in our methodology, for um, helping us out when we really needed it. And to Professor Daniel Gonzalez and Dr. Karen Reiner, thank you for organizing this wonderful research symposium. And at this time, we'll be taking any questions that you guys have. Oh, her question is, why did we decide to use DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide, as our solvent? Okay, according to the previous groups that have researched synthetic compounds before us, DMSO is a good solvent for um, dissolving synthetic compounds because it's inert. So that means that it won't like change the chemical components of the compounds that we've been given. So there won't be really like any changes to it. So, you know, everything is still intact. Any more questions? 
How do you discover new drugs that bacteria are not resistant to? <laughs> um, so what we did in this study was we took two drugs that were well known as antimicrobial. Um, they had their own antimicrobial properties and we put them together and that made the compounds that we had. So what um, we focused on was taking <clears throat> antibiotics that were well known with activity against gram positive and gram negative um, bacteria and then testing them. So usually what you try to do is try to take things that are well known and trying to tweak them minorly and seeing if maybe that could increase susceptibility or and try to figure out from there. We really didn't have too much difficulty with solubility. We know that's sometimes been a problem in the past, and we were fortunate that just giving it a little bit of time, we were able to get everything to dissolve well. Any other questions? Okay, that's it. Thank you. I would like to thank you for attending our uh, MLS Research Symposium. Uh, let's give another round of applause to everybody that worked very well <clears throat> on this. And uh, for those of you that are watching online, also thank you for joining us. I know uh, we had a lot of um, alumni from this program watching all the way from the West Coast in Loma Linda uh, to the East Coast in John Hopkins. So thank you for that. And I would like to ask uh, our dean if you would have a word of prayer for us uh, to close this program, and um, we can finish. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your opportunity to learn this uh, wonderful institution, for the privilege of learning, for health and strength, and the ability to process in peace. We pray that you continue to bless this uh, faculty and the students, and that you continue to help us as we work to assist the facility of learning. We pray for your guidance and direction, protection from danger, from harm, and from temptation, that all may be well. We pray for you. Amen. Thank you for coming. Uh, for those of you that are